And let's get some slides here. Here we are. All right. Now, I don't know if you recognize this. This is the railway cut behind St. Mary's. That, uh, and I can't remember now who sent me the photo. I should have put it on here. She sent it to me at the start of January. And uh, thinking of memorable photos. That uh, if you know St. Mary's, if you've been there, uh, behind it, um, behind Gorsebrook Avenue, is an old house called the Stanfield House. Uh, I think Robert Stanfield, a former premier, owned it at one time. Uh, but it's a large tract of property that goes in behind. And in fact, it, part of the property is right along the railway cut. And there's a really fun, nice walking trail. Get away from everybody. So if you're back at school in the future and you need a break um, just to unwind, de-stress, decompress, uh, that go behind that house, go through the woods, and you'll find trails running along uh, the railway cut and heading west, I guess, all the way over to Beaufort Avenue. It comes out in behind a whole bunch of houses. But it's a really nice spot. Make sure you got some decent shoes. Don't wear high heels. <laughs> it's, it's The trail is a bit rough. But uh, for me, it was always a very nice relaxing spot and so I really appreciate it when a student sent me that photo back in January. So um, I am still in Kingsburg. No this isn't today but it was a couple weeks ago down here um, that uh, the beach is down here behind but this is walking down that's my wife there. We were out for a walk uh, in the snow and it was just so peaceful relaxing there and uh, the snow is on the trees. You know, we've had a nice winter in that regard in terms of some really, really pretty snow days. And this just got sent to me yesterday. And if you've been on campus, if you were returning as a student, you would know Carlton. Uh, Carlton is a cat that lives in the neighborhood around St. Mary's, but seems to live at St. Mary's. Uh, Carlton, I don't know if Carlton's a boy or a girl, uh, spends uh, pretty much his whole day on campus. And uh, he, he would visit me in my in my office on a regular basis, mainly because I had cat treats, I think, in there. But he'd come up and sit on my desk beside my computer uh, uh, or on my computer. Uh, and then he'd move on and he'd visit someone else. He never stayed too long. That they, uh, one of my former staff uh, uh, over in the registrar's office, uh, Carlton used to like sleeping in her basket that she kept, you know, sort of like an in basket, that sort of thing. That was his bed for part of the day. Uh, but this one was, uh, and oh, Carlton also came to class. When he came into my class, he would get up and walk on tables and that sort of thing, and nobody paid any attention to me. Maybe they never paid attention to me, but. Uh, uh, he was a welcome addition in that regard. Uh, and this was taken over, uh, I think, in the library yesterday morning. Uh, one of the students was over there working on her assignment. And uh, Carlton came in, curled up by her chair on her book bag. <laughs> Marley was the student. And uh, so she took a picture of Carlton. I don't know if you can see his little name tag on here. It's actually a, um, the library made that up, I understand. And it looks like a St. Mary's ID card with uh, Carlton's picture on it. Really cute. Um, but uh, it's, again, nice memories of St. Mary's. I haven't been there since sometime the early summer, I think I had to stop by, but I haven't been by the campus since. Anyway, I promised you we'd look at assignment three. And I was wondering if you've got specific questions that you've got on your mind, and if you could just start popping them up in the chat. Uh, hopefully you've been working at it. I haven't had too many emails. More on clarification, 
a couple technical problems, but not many. Um, so I don't know if people aren't working at it, uh, that uh, or if it's actually going very smoothly, better than previous assignments have. Oops, matrix typing. But uh, I'm going to bring up the assignment. Oops, I guess I should make it smaller so I can see your chat. There we go. The, uh, so um, uh, in the past, I've used some housing data for assignments because it was available. I had a data set, but it was American. So over the break, I spent a chunk of time downloading property listings from online from this website called Viewpoint. And if you're interested at all in real estate in Nova Scotia, anywhere in Nova Scotia, you can look up what the house down the street just sold for, that property just sold for. They've got everything in the province catalogued. You can, if it didn't sell, <coughs> that you can still click on the property and find out what its assessment was or its sales history is. They've uh, captured all kinds of provincial data um, and other stuff in there. So what does the, oh, very at the end, the residual car plot. Yeah, we'll get to that one. That, uh, so when you bring up the website, uh, you can, just like Google Maps, you can scroll in and out and all over the place, and it lists every property. It's got its property ID number. So if you went to the assessment office, you could look it up there as well. Sometimes they give more information there. Uh, all of the little, mm, I don't know what color you call that. It's sort of a pinkish color. Those are properties that have sold. There is one here that's in blue that's for sale. Um, that was just after I collected the data, it came up. But I've captured an area that's from Quinpool Road, which sort of runs down the middle of the peninsula and uh, going north of it as far as Bears Road. And so, um, what sort of printout do you need? What sort of table? Yep, I'll do that. I've had that question. And so it's an old neighborhood. It's fairly stable in terms of, or consistent. Some areas, older parts of the city, we're seeing houses ripped down and new ones built up. So there it's more complicated to assess value of homes. But uh, so what I've asked you to do with the data set is each time you do something, create a new tab in the data set and paste it in. And let me just show you what I mean. And I'll show you an example of that very first one. But, and hopefully I've given you reasonably clear instructions for each of these tasks. So the first one asks just doing a scatter diagram with bathrooms and prices. So this is the data set. Um, most of them, it says over here, units. Let me just make this smaller so you can see what I've got. Um, Oh, get over here. Um, one of the columns here is units. And most of them are one, but sometimes you'll get more uh, up to, like one of them has four units in it. Um, it's a very big property. It actually spans, I think they took almost two houses and joined them. And most of these houses were built as single family dwellings but they may have expanded them or subdivided them uh, and made them into apartments. They get a little more complicated to value, but uh, most are, and you can see they're generally quite old. So I've asked you to start out by looking at price and uh, where is it? Bathrooms. So select the two columns, copy them, Create a new sheet and do this with each question. Oh, come on, do that. Label it. Now, I don't need to see this, but it's going to help you when digging through and try to track what you're done. So this was for question one. And um, let me make it bigger. And I'll show you the first thing that students may run into problems with. I want a scatter diagram. So I could just do this one, go insert, uh, recommended charts, 
It's going to give me a scatter diagram and throw it up like this. And this is the wrong sort of chart. What this chart tells me is more expensive homes have more bathrooms. We're going to be trying to predict price, so you need to change axes. Okay. Some students will think, oh, that's switching rows and columns. We talked about this before, but it may have slipped by you. That doesn't work. That you try switching it and you get this garbage. What's this mean? No. Um, rows and columns doesn't do it. What you've got to do, get rid of this guy, is cut this out, move it over, put it down, and generally I get rid of my old column here just because I make mistakes. So remember in Excel that X has to be on the left, Y is on the right, and then if you do an insert and you get a chart, we get the right sort of chart. And it's one where there isn't of course, you've got one bathroom, one and a half. That means one of the bathrooms a full one with a shower or a, a bathtub in it. Um, and one of them is just um, uh, got a little sink and a toilet. And that's all that's in there. And uh, most of these homes were built with only one full bathroom in it. They've since, some have added a half, some have renovated and put a second one in there. But given their age, they probably didn't have two bathrooms originally. But uh, that's so do that sort of thing with each one. Make up one of these sorts of things that to be able to do these uh, scatter charts. That um, oh sorry, I wanted a box and whisker chart based on this. Excuse me, I did the wrong chart. Let me go backwards. So with this one. Box and whisker, you start out with price, go and insert that uh, recommended charts. Now I've just got one variable. So I'll go down and I've got to say box and whisker. And there I get one. It's got a couple outliers, but the rest is pretty normal looking. Yeah, you're right. Construct a box and whisker chart or price. <sighs> the, and I'm not sure if the instructions. Um, uh, no, I didn't have a different question one. I made a mistake. I, it, it did say box and whisker. In this one, it asks for, or the part B of the question, let me get the question back. I'm being too quick here. So it said make a box and whisker chart, put the chart in there. But now I want to look at bathrooms, number of bathrooms. So to do that with a box and whisker chart, it's a little more complicated than with my scatter diagram. What I have to do is go up and select data. And now on the horizontal axis, I've got to tell it what I want. So on my X axis. So I go to edit and it wants to know, well, where is the data? So I grab this stuff. There aren't too many rows to it. Click OK. Click OK again. And you'll know, you'll know you've got it right if it's got those values listed there for you that of how many bathrooms and that sort of thing and click OK and if I scroll up there it is so there you can see that it does look like it's going up there's a little bit of problems out here don't worry about it what's happened with this one here with four there's only one house that has four bathrooms in it there's only a couple that have three. There are actually ones that have a couple of apartments in them. And then here are all the others. So this is what it looks like as a box and whisker. Here's what it looked like as a scatter diagram. And that, as you can see, there's only one with four, only three that had three bathrooms. And then here's where the bulk of the data is. And it's hard to tell with all the dots. Is there a lot of dots here or a few? Whereas here with the box and whisker, it helps show me where that concentration is. So it's, it's a little different from a scatter diagram to be able to help show patterns. And obviously this one up here is an outlier. 
Did it look that way here? Eh, maybe not to the same extent. Okay. But um, so this is our um, sort of chart that we're trying to put together here. Actually, there's something wrong with this one. I think I know what happened. Oh, there are. Uh, here's what's strange on it. The uh, you'll notice here it goes 1.5, 1, 2.5, 2, 3, and 4. And so I probably told you how to fix that. That um, I told, I warned you here. Sort the data. Okay. Which I didn't do. I'm not reading my own question. So if I go back here, let me see if I can get it to work. If it'll work or not. I don't know if it'll fix it in hindsight. Go to data, go to sort. I want it to sort by the first column. Well, bathroom, okay, smallest to largest. Here, it fixed my chart for me. That's better. So now it's going up the way it should look. Did you catch that? So there are a lot of little tricks to doing this. You need to have some patience. I'd like you to go ideally with every chart and put in a title. And so uh, prices increase with more bathrooms. You can make up your own title that you should be going over here to format whoops sorry design there it is add i've got it out of the way here add chart element so put access titles on them so down here i'm going to make this into uh number bathrooms And I'm going to go back and add one on the vertical, and I'll put in price. Oops, don't need to put. And if you want to be fussy like me, you'll try to change it. I don't think I think I, we did, tried this before and I couldn't do it. Or oops, no, excuse me. You have to be clicking right on that axis title. And will it let me rotate it? Oh, sorry. No, it won't. For some reason, it can do it in a scatter chart, but I can't do it in a box and whisker chart. So do this with each of your questions as you're going through. Build these individual pieces. Um, and Generally, with the comments, like in your previous ones, I'm looking for a reflection on it. I don't get into a lot of right answers and wrong answers. That, um, But this one here, I'm asking, do you think it's the main reason why they sell more? You know, the price we saw go up. Is that the driving force or is there something else behind it? So I'm always getting you to think when you see a pattern, one of the first questions you should ask yourself, is okay price goes up with bathrooms is that what the relationship is or is there something else potentially causing both of them to increase both price and number of bathrooms is there an alternate explanation and that should be a habit you get into always just questioning it and making sure that you've uh you're not reading the wrong thing and in most instances hopefully what you see is correct, but sometimes there's an alternate reason. Um, that uh, So th then I get you to do, I believe it's a scatter chart on price and space, and then do correlation on some of the variables like assessment, list, and price. Just to, for clarity with some people, that, you know, Dealing with data sets and variables, they may not always be familiar to you as to what they represent. 
So this data that you've got is about homes that were put for sale and what they sold for, what the final price was. And so the, and that's the key thing that we're trying to identify is how much will this house sell for? That there was a list price that these homes were put up for sale and then we see, okay, how much did it sell for? With, uh, it's interesting and we may look at this next class, but, uh, or the next assignment, uh, this is how long ago it went up for sale, how many days ago from when I looked at it. And in the past, we would normally see a house that's put up for sale, it sold, sold for a little bit less than the list price. And that was common. Uh, here's 449, it sold for 442. Because the buyer wants to do a little negotiating and that type of thing. But look at ones that sold more recently. The asking price was $595. It sold for $689. A bidding war happened. Um, we're into a crazy real estate market in Halifax, one that hasn't been seen in decades. Uh, it's all across the province it's happening, or at least in certain communities, where the demand far exceeds the supply. And when a house goes up for sale, it seems to be selling very, very, very quickly. And in many instances, there are multiple buyers putting in offers the same day. Uh, sometimes the seller will put it up for sale saying, okay, it's being put up for sale today. It's a Wednesday. We're going to have a viewing on Sunday. And so if you want to come and see it, you've got to book an appointment to view it on Sunday because of COVID that has to be by appointment. And you have until Tuesday to put an offer in. And it becomes a bidding war. Um, yeah, a hundred thousand of three years ago. Some of them are that within a year ago, and it's become a crazy bidding war. We're seeing it in many parts of the province. Um, uh, it's really crazy, and there are other places in Canada that it's happening. Uh, COVID is driving some of it because this is demand for single-family dwellings, uh, detached homes uh, that. Uh, what isn't selling is condominiums. There's a surplus of them. Um, they, uh, 250 over the evaluator. It's really crazy. Yeah, there could be a crash. Um, it, it's, we've worried about that before, but actually in Canada, we haven't had any serious crashes other than what happened in Alberta after oil prices plummeted. But that was a different cause to it. So those are the ones that we're seeing in terms of how much you are asking for it and how much it's selling for. And I said, it's a crazy game at the moment. And the assessment is what the, the province uses a uh, uh, public, well, it's a not-for-profit company, I believe, property valuation services uh, company that goes around and tries to assess the what a property would sell for and updates that every year. And they've got a whole team of assessors that do this. They're not especially, they've got so many properties to evaluate. They don't do a very exacting job. And that basically what they do is they take last year's price and they try to look at the neighborhood and see how much it's gone up. And then they revise the assessment, but they tend to lag behind uh, prices. And so you'll see these assessments all are much lower than what the prices are. And that's common. Uh, sometimes the assessment is quite good, but in many instances, it's, it's um, out of date, even though they're updating it annually. Uh, also, uh, if you don't like your assessment, you can go and lodge a complaint. And uh, that uh, if more often than not, they will just to make you go away, reduce your assessment by a small amount. Uh, so the assessments do tend to underestimate value. But these are our three figures reflecting value. What the government thought it was worth for taxes, what the real estate agent thought you could get for it if you put it up for sale, what was a reasonable asking price, and then what was the actual selling price. So we're going to start out looking at seeing, okay, what's the pattern among those and fitting a model within it.
Okay. So let me check the questions and look at one of them. And let's questions come up about question three. So let's look at question three. We're going to look at assessment and look at selling price. Okay. And I've asked you a variety of things. Now, let me do um, a similar one. Um, can I do it with list price instead? Just so I don't give you exactly the same data in your assignment. Okay. So let me take the listing value and the selling price and put them into a separate sheet. It's bigger. Okay. And now I've got them in the right order I'd like them in because the list is what comes first. It's your X variable. Y is always going to be in your price. Just take a look at a scatter chart of this. Oh, yeah. Very strong predictor. Okay. we can. This is a beautiful, nice straight line. Um, we do have three outliers here. They're distracting. But even if I ignored those three, because they'll have a lot of pull on this line, what I've got left here does look to be a very, very strong straight line pattern. This is this is really good. This is um, what we hope for when we're doing regression analysis. Then I ask, well, let's look at the correlation. So I could go to data, data analysis, and what's the correlation? So I'm going to take list and price. And it's in columns. I've got labels. I'm going to put it. I'm sorry, let's, can I move this guy up here? I want to put it on my worksheet here. Let me, um, I'm going to put it uh, hopefully further up in column uh, D. Let me put it in D12. That should be clean. There's D12. Oops, sorry, it's hidden. Haha. <laughs> you move you over a little bit then. There we go. Stop moving. There he is. So it says that the correlation between list and price is 0.95. Very high correlation. That's what we're seeing here, a very strong pattern that's within that. So if I then went and said, build me a model, I'm going to go to data analysis. I'm going to go down to regression. Click OK. So first my Y variable, that's price. And let me just put in the range here. It's in B1 to B87. And my X's are in column A1 to A87. I've got labels. And I want my output to be, I'm going to put it in uh, D, let me put it right here, okay? Some students have asked about residuals. I'm going to ask for those um, anyway, because we will in some questions later, and I'll click OK. And it gives me a whole bunch of things. Now, in your assignment, one of the first questions I'm getting has to do with, let me make this a little bit small. Oh, what did I do? Oh, I added a sheet. I didn't want that. Excuse me. The wrong thing. What to put into your assignment? Because I'm saying give you, give me the output. I don't want all of this stuff. Never do. Okay. What I want is this. So if you could go and use your snipping tool, go and snip this stuff. And you don't have to go all the way across. You know. So you can if you want to go over here, but uh, mainly it's the first couple of columns that are relevant. And all I'm looking for is to see, did you do it? Okay. And if the first couple of columns look right, then the rest of it must be. And so with uh, 
um, put a copy in. Now, say I'm not using assessment, and just put that in there. That's all you need to do. It asks, what's the equation? It asks you about um, interpreting the slope and the intercept. And, oh, it did ask you to do that one, and the R square and that sort of thing. Oh, OK, we've done both models. I, I didn't realize I asked you to do both. So anyway, we've done it for list price. Interpreting it, what does it mean? Well, this one, the interpretation, hello, will it let me into this? Oh, this is the picture, excuse me, I'm in the wrong. I want to get over to my spreadsheet. So this one, just as a habit, um, let me, excuse me. My eyes tend to water a lot. Let me make my font bigger so you can see what I'm doing here. And I'm going to say that the estimated average is price. So the line reflects on average what the home will sell for, not what a particular house will sell for. The intercept is 49,000. Um, oh, no, I can't see. $570. Maybe I should put a comma in here. Plus 0.948. I'm, I'm just going to put 9.5 times the list price. So if I had asked you to interpret these two values, this first one, the one that we call the intercept, reflects if the house was put for sale for nothing, for zero, it would actually sell for almost $50,000. Crazy number, silly, doesn't make sense. But if you look at this picture, and if I was to put a line through it, take this out of here, see this dotted line here, and Make it bigger so you can see. I wish I could, didn't print it so small. If you took this line here and extended it backwards, we don't have homes that are down here, but if we did, it would go down and hit at about $50,000. So that's all it represents here. Okay. So it's our starting value. And then it says as the asking price goes up by $1, the selling price goes up by $0.95, okay? That the, so if the asking price went up by $100,000, the actual selling price would only go up by $95,000. I don't know if you catch what's happening here. That the this crazy difference between list price and asking price it's actually really impacting the low end of the market it's a lot of it is those homes that where the asking price in this particular neighborhood are between about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars and probably about six hundred thousand dollars the ones down at this end the ones that are up at the top end the really high ones that the actual selling price may actually be lower than the list price. There isn't huge demand for big, expensive homes. The million dollar homes are still having trouble selling and getting their full price. But the ones that are in the three fifty to $600,000 range, they're selling like crazy. And they're the ones selling more than the asking price. So the 0.95 says that the line doesn't go up selling price doesn't go up as quickly as the list price does. But we're starting at a base of $50,000. So there's an automatic boost to all the low-priced homes. Anyway, um, 
So try to give some type of interpretation for these and think about what's going on there. Because in this one, studying those two things tells me which homes are selling above their asking price and which ones are probably not, are selling below their asking price. These ones out here are selling below the asking price. These ones out here are selling above. If I drew a line, let's see if I can do this. Um, I drew a line that went from, whoops, zero up to, and I don't know if you can quite see it. It's not, it's going to be hard to see that this line here would reflect homes that are selling for their list price, selling for what uh, they're listed at. And you'll see these lower ones are selling above that line. Whereas the ones that are out here are selling below. And that has to do with the nature of the slope and the intercept in this one. Do, 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 do. Um, with correlation, um, and building it, okay. So when you print a copy, we should attach, yeah, do what I did here, snip a picture, just like you've done in other assignments, snip a picture of it and paste it into the assignment, into that space, okay? But don't give me all the residual stuff, just this first table, okay? Or a correlation table, paste it in like a correlation among all of these uh, different variables that I've got here. That, um, again, I'm asking you to fit another simple one here with one that's got uh, price and space. So you would be taking, uh, where's my revised data? If I took price and the amount of space. So this is total square footage, uh, even if it's not really finished living space. So some of that's up in attic space and, and some partially finished uh, basement space. Again, just out of preference, move price over to the other side of space. I like to have my Y variable as my last variable. Um, in part, in case I want to do scatter charts. And this is one that if you did the correlations, you'd find it's reasonably high for these two. If you did a scatter chart, you get this. It, um, it does have a problem that if you were doing a stats course that we'd worry about because it's a V shape. Um, this makes some aspects of, you can guess your predictions out here are not as good as back here because there's more spread. It doesn't stay the same, but that's beyond our course. And I've asked you to fit a line through that. So let me just see what that line is sort of going to look like. And uh, whoops. Okay, it's going to look like this. So I can see it's going to go back and it's going to have an intercept probably around 200,000. And then there's going to be a slope to it. That, that you're asked to do fit a regression line. And these are all same pattern each time. So uh, it's actually the same as I had last time. My Y is in column B from 1 to 87. And my X is in column A from 1 to 87. I've got labels. I'm going to want my output. Uh, D16 is just fine. And I'm going to keep residuals. So if I asked you to make a copy of the output, then I'm asking you to go and snip this material here and just copy this. You could 
actually copy this as a table instead of a picture and I could put it into my assignment. So um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Um, now this one just asked me for the equation of the line. It didn't ask for the whole output, but I could. And there it's putting it in as a table. Okay, it gets messy. I like a picture. It's um, uh, the way it's formatted in Excel and copied over to Word. Sometimes the format changes around. It asked me though for the equation. I can show you that. We've done that in a sense. Okay? When you're looking at the equation of a line, and I'm just going to do it here so that I can see everything. Where am I here? My estimated average price. I hammer away at this. I know it's repetitive. This is just an estimate. I've only got 86 houses that I'm looking at. It's not hundreds and thousands of them. It's only going to be a rough estimate. And that uh, it's of the average price. It's where the line is, not where the scatter is. My intercept, I thought it was around 200. It's 191. And then I get. 212.22. Uh, if you want, you can put a dollar sign on that guy too, because it's these are all dollars we're calculating. Times space. So if I was asked to interpret this, what does it represent? What's the 191,000? It says a house that. <laughs> has no space, so it's not a house. Um, there's no house here. So I guess it's just the land would sell for $191,000. If I was to extend this line all the way back, and if the scatter continued that way, I don't have homes that are much under 1,000 square feet. Um, that's a fairly small house um, that the um, most apartments are 1,000 square feet. The two-bedroom apartment, anyway, would be that. Uh, so this is a tiny house. So it's an empty plot of land, essentially. But I don't know for sure, okay, because um, it's not really valid to put a line all the way back here where I've never been there. Maybe it just drops like a rock, and it's much lower. And the land itself only is worth $50,000, and that... Um, it's really not worth anything until I get up to a reasonable size house. I'm not going to buy a shed. If, the, if it was a piece of land with a 200 square foot shed sitting on it, I'd probably demolish the shed and build a house. So the, the structure has no value to me. It's not until it gets up here that anybody wants it. And then the slope is how much the price increases as the house gets larger. And so you're, um, you've got it exactly, Scott. That is perfect. Slope is the rise over the run. So on the vertical axis, I've got price in dollars. How many dollars do I go up? On the horizontal, I've got square feet. So how many dollars do I go up if I go across by one square foot? So that's exactly what the slope represents. And at the moment, yeah, to build a house, you're spending a finished construction at least $200 a square foot these days. Um, probably more right now um, that uh, there's a real shortage of building materials and it's still going on. It's happened since last March. And uh, uh, they say that lumber prices and a lot of supplies are much more expensive. Uh, because there's supply shortages. So, um, yeah, that uh, that's the value increases by about $200 a square foot. The, uh, so that fits with what we might think. It's not far off. This is an older home, so the price per square foot would probably be somewhat lower. If this was in a diverse 
community out in Bedford South or something like that, where it's new home construction. And we've got a variety of homes of different sizes so that we could build this. Um, the trouble in looking in, in some new neighborhoods is all the houses are the same. They're exactly the same size. Um, there isn't a lot of variation in price. Um, but if you've got a, a fairly diverse one, yeah, we can get that out of it. Um, it asks about the R square and the standard error. Just to remind you, this R square says of the variation in price, and there's a lot of variation in price, anywhere from just under four hundred thousand dollars up over a million dollars. Most of it between about three hundred and eighty thousand and about eight hundred thousand dollars in price. Of that variation from house to house. About half of the variation, that's what we say, can be explained by how big the house is. Other aspects of price are explained probably by other variables, maybe the condition of the house, number of bathrooms, what the kitchen looks like, those sorts of things. And it says if I was to make a prediction with this line, it looks like a nice scatter around the line, but how big is that scatter above and below? Take a look at it. From here, here's one where I'm predicting uh, it's a 2,000 square foot house selling for $600,000 right here in the middle. It might sell for 800,000. It might sell for 400,000. So it's a lot of spread there, $200,000 either way. Two standard errors. Well, guess what? My standard error is $96,000. So double that, you've got about 200. So as I've said, my rule of thumb is plus or minus two standard errors is you should have most of your scatter. Um, as I mentioned to you before, this data is a little problematic because of this V shape. Predictions for small homes are more accurate than predictions for big homes. So on average, I'm out by that, but I'm better at predicting small ones than I am at big ones. So. There are tools to deal with that, but that's beyond our course to deal with that sort of thing. Um, do do. I ask you to take the residuals and the other variables, okay, and do a bunch of things to that. So, if you ask for the residuals, they're sitting down here. Go and grab these guys. You can grab the other things too if you want, and go and um, put them into, what's going on here? Look, get that stuff out of my way. Um, where was I here? Okay, I want a new sheet. There are my residuals, and I want my other variables. I'm not sure which ones I want. I guess it's, um, days maybe, and I'm not going to use assessment, bathroom, uh, I've got living, I've already used space, what the lot size is, age, number of units, steal all of those ones, in here, um, as I said, I like to put this guy on my right, um, you don't have to. I just try to do this out of habit, so I always keep the variable I'm predicting over here. And, uh, oh, R squared thing again, excuse me. I better remember the chat. Let's go back. Okay. What is R square? R square is this guy here. It's a, a very crude measure and I find a deceptive measure just like you were deceived by correlations on the test that the correlations tend to get bigger than the scatter really reflects them to be but um, many people like simple measures and R square is hugely popular really is and so if you were comparing two models and wanted to know which one was better the one with the higher R square is the one giving you better predictions. And 
some people like to try to assign an interpretation to the actual number. And what they try to say, and there is a certain rationale behind it, but I find it still deceptive, is that there's variability in house prices. Okay, If I was to um, uh, do, 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 do. just it's deceptive. I'm going to use a box chart again because I don't have anything, else. or I could use a histogram. Well, maybe that. Let's do a histogram. Tired to do. You can see house prices vary. They go from three hundred and sixty thousand dollars up to that one point two million. A lot in the low range. There's some really high ones. There's a lot of variability here. Why is there so much variability? Well, what my chart here is telling me is part of the reason is some homes are bigger than others. Small homes tend to sell for less than big homes. Now, you know, if you look at it, here's homes selling for four hundred thousand dollars. I've got a two thousand or a less than a thousand square foot home selling for that, and a two thousand square foot home selling for that. So it doesn't explain everything. I can have two homes completely different sizes that still sell for the same price. Okay. That I can have a home that is bigger selling for less than one that's smaller because there are other things that are taking place. But overall, big homes sell for more than little homes. And the size explains about 50% of this variability. That if I did, um, after I took account of the size of the home and I looked at the variability in prices, I will find the variability is much less. Now I'm looking, my guesses were say plus or minus a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars. Without knowing the size of the home, my guesses might be plus or minus three hundred or four hundred thousand dollars. So I'm much better. So R square is just a measure, and the common language used is that we've explained 50% of the variability in house prices by taking account of how large the house is. Long. So hopefully that worked. If not, let me know in the chat. So here I've got all of these variables. And so all I'm asking for is go and take all of this data that we've got here and we're going to do a correlation. So these are things that are you know, pretty straightforward to do. There's nothing fancy here in telling you. So I'm going to go from column A to column I. I wish. Maybe I need a computer with a bigger screen instead of a little notebook here. Anyway, I'm going to put this up top in A1. I get a table. Now, I did have a student that got a table that was crazy. It was getting division by zero errors uh, coming up. There are some ways this can happen. One. If you ended up, if I went to column J and gave it a blank column as well as the others, I'm going to get errors because it can't deal with the blanks. Can't do calculations on blanks for a correlation. That particular student actually had done a filter on the number of units and looked only at single family dwellings. So there was no variability in size of home. And that ended up screwing up, messing up part of the correlation table, anything to do with number of units. So this is my new correlation table. Here we go. And I am trying to explain my mistakes, my residuals. Okay. And if I look at that, I get residuals get smaller, negative as number of days increases. Uh, bigger as the number of bedrooms goes up, bathrooms a little bit, living space a little bit, uh, age 
Hmm, interesting. They get bigger as the home gets older. They get bigger as the number of units gets larger. But the biggest one is in bedrooms. That um, you might notice bedrooms highly correlated with number of units. It's somewhat correlated with the size of the home. I thought it would be a stronger correlation, but it isn't. Um, not much with the lot size. With the living space, functional living space, it's more correlated. Um, number of bathrooms, somewhat. But I've asked you now to build a model that has two variables. Okay. So with that one, what you're going to do is build a model with the amount of space and the number of bedrooms. So you may want to go and pick those and put them into a new sheet. And remember, we're not predicting residuals anymore. I'm predicting price, so I need to get the price over there too. Put that into my new sheet. And just so you can see it. So I've got bedrooms as a variable, space as a bedroom, and price. Not too important which sequence you put bedrooms and space. Doesn't matter which comes first. Fit a new model. So you're going to do data analysis. You're going to do regression. My Y variable is now in column C. Watch that. Um, I, in making up solutions to this, made many mistakes. I'm clumsy. And, um, oh, there, I think I've got a mistake. I think I've left out a colon. Oops, no, I put in a column C. Now that won't work. Column B. Be careful that. My variables are columns A and B from rows 1 to 87. I've got labels. I want uh, output. I'm going to put my output up in B1. I'm going to keep residuals and residual plots. Gives me a new model. I've gone from an R square before of 50%. Now it's 62%. It's better. Coefficients are different. I'm now starting at 173,000 instead of 191. A square foot of space is now $161 instead of 212. And a bedroom is worth $28,725 to me. And that becomes my new model. And I can write out the equation, hopefully, for my new model. Hopefully, you can handle that. Um, look at residual plots. What are they looking like? So I've got two of them. This one doesn't look too bad. It gets a little bit wider for bigger ones, but then we saw that before. Our predictions aren't as good for big homes as they are for smaller ones. But I've asked you to comment on this plot and anything that you see in there that may trouble you like a house with 15 bedrooms, anyway. Um, some house. Uh, so look at those sorts of things. And that's where the, oops, didn't I ask you to do something else here? Uh, no, that's where we end. There was a question at the beginning having to do with car. And now I think of it, that had to do with the old assignment that I gave as a sample, where um, I asked you to build a very complex model. This one here, um, I uh, stopped at getting one that gets too messy, I think. Um, yeah, I didn't go any further than that. But um, what do I look like in 3B? 3B is just something like that. Paste in that. Just take paste in that output. Don't 
do the residual stuff below it. Just take a picture of this and paste it in. Okay. But, um, where was it in the chat? Excuse me. Uh, explaining with the residual car plot. And the residual car plot, yeah, was uh, that was from uh, the assignment from uh, last semester that I had. Yeah, you're on the wrong one. But um, uh, I can't. I don't think there was anything exciting in that one. I can't remember. But the solutions for that assignment are there, so you should be able to see what went on within that one. Hopefully you haven't gone and tried to do assignment three from uh, from last term. But last term I used data from the US. And, uh, so are we okay at the moment? Are there other questions? Are we good? Okay, what are we for time? We got 15 minutes. Let me recap a couple of things and I'll give you an idea of where we're going next because I can compress what's left. We're this, um, it's the last lecture I'll actively, today, going through this, actively be using Excel, okay? That, uh, except towards the very, very end. So we've been doing our modeling. We've been talking about this stuff. We've been doing value estimation with, this time with house prices. That, um, that, trying to guess, could we be any better than a real estate agent at predicting what a price what price a home will sell for. And maybe it would be helpful to explain why do some houses sell for more than others. And some of that you could probably guess. But often when building it, we can find that some things really aren't important in terms of house prices. That um, the, uh, uh, and we've been using linear regression We've been talking about accuracy of our predictions, how close we can predict the house price. But there are other strategies. And so if you're looking at house prices, um, real estate agents don't use regression analysis. They, uh, many of them actually use viewpoint. They will go online. They will look around at other homes that have sold in that neighborhood. They'll look at the specs on those properties. They'll look at pictures of the properties. And on Viewpoint, you can see lots of pictures. And they have a big influence. They give you an idea of the condition of the home. And they will look for ones that they think are quite similar. And uh, that they'll find, uh, I know when talking with a, prop, a property estimator or assessor that works for banks for um, mortgages and loans, he tended to only find about five homes that he felt were similar that had sold within the last two or three years in a neighborhood. And from there, he guesstimated what he thought a home would sell for. Um, if I was trying to predict how a student would perform, I might find a number of students that had similar characteristics and that uh, we'll look at how did they do. And we actually use this approach uh, in a different fashion. Several years ago, we introduced a program for first-year students that it was believed would really help students be successful. Um, that, And initially, we looked at it and found, well, students that enrolled in the program did have better grades than students that didn't enroll. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're, you're not comparing the same students. Students that opt into the program are different because they opted into the program. Let me look back and find for each student that went in the program, I'm going to look up what high school they went to. Oh, this one went to Dartmouth High. What was their average? Ah, it was 78. Let me find a student with an average at Dartmouth High between 75 and 80 that also studied the program, same program, say a Bachelor of Arts and had the same gender, because we knew grades varied by gender, by program, and by high school grades, and by high school. Um, and we matched students. So for every student in the program, we matched three students 
that had the same characteristics but were not in the program. And then we compared performance between the two. And we found students in the program did no better, no worse than the students that weren't in the program when we matched them with similar students. So we used the similarity as a way of doing that. And so we didn't use a formula. We just used similarity of doing it. And we're going to talk about that coming up as a technique. And we're going to use it in classification as opposed to value estimation. But it is used frequently. Um, and many of you raise these types of things in the discussion on um, how you assess car repairs or that type of thing. It's experience of finding similar cases. So using history, historical patterns. But um, causal analysis is nice because it tells us the role of different factors in doing that. Where similarity doesn't tell me how much had to do with the student's program or their gender or where they went to high school, I can't separate those things out. But regret if I do causal analysis, I might be able to find an explanation of why some students do better than others. And uh, But I can only do that if I don't have a bad case of multicollinearity. My variables are too interconnected, I may have trouble. I think in your assignment, by the looks of things, I thought space and bedrooms would be more highly correlated. So if I knew how big the house was, I'd know how many bedrooms there were. It turns out that's not really that strong a relationship. And so I may be able to separate out space and bedrooms. Not quite. There is a bit of a problem still. Um, and also think about, um, I guess, another way of, of that multicollinearity is thinking about Simpson's paradox. That I saw C cause A and C cause B, two things seem to be affecting both things. But it looks to me like A and B are related to each other when it's something else that's affecting both of them at the same time. So I might be looking at a correlation between two variables, but actually both of them are related to one other one causing both of them to happen. So be careful when looking at this. And generally, we'll see that with multicollinearity. Um, it's sort of like Simpson's paradox. It's one where it's part of the reason as well why I keep asking you when you see a pattern, ask yourself, is that really the reason why this is happening? So I asked you initially, hey, price goes up as bathrooms go up. So is it really the number of bathrooms that's causing price to increase? Or is it something else? If there are more bedrooms, I can probably have more bathrooms. In today's new homes, that's definitely the case. And if I got a bigger home, I'll probably have more bathrooms. Definitely the case with new homes now. So watch that. We've looked at uh, using binary variables, and we worked through that sort of stuff. Um, we've looked at non-linear things, and our measure of accuracy with standard error. In the stuff we're getting into next, it's going to change. Okay. Um, pause, I'm going to skip all of this. What I want to look at now in just a couple of minutes is classification, and just introduce this initially to you. So I may not be wanting to predict the student's grade point average, but whether or not they're going to come back next year. Can I predict customer churn? So are they going to renew their subscription? In a sense, if you're a returning student, you've renewed your subscription at St. Mary's to take more courses, that type of thing. And I might also want to look at, do some causal analysis. What could I change to make someone come back? Or what if I do this, will they go away? You know, I, I can I find what's causing them to leave or what's causing them to stay? They may not be the same type of things. There may be factors, if this happens, they'll leave. So don't do it. Whereas it's something completely different you have to do to entice someone to stay that's considering leaving. But um, So these are classification problems. So I'm predicting a categorical variable 
I, I may be using numerical data to predict the value of a, um, a yes or a no. I'm only going to look at binary variables. I'm not going to look at, say, building a model to predict whether the student would want to go into arts, business, or science. That's three different choices. That's too complicated for me to build. I am I just want to introduce the concept to you, and it's easiest to do in the most common application where it's a yes, no. It's a, it's a binary type of decision. That is the customer going to stay, customer going to leave with a transaction. Is it a valid transaction or a fraudulent one? That will this borrower pay off their loan? Or are they going to cause me problems? Are I going to have default? Are I going to have issues? Is the student going to graduate? Or are they going to drop out at some time? Will the customer respond to this promotion, this incentive? Or will they not respond? So it's all yes, no, binary variables. And it's a lot trickier. Even the idea of accuracy, how do we measure accuracy? In accuracy with value estimation is how close is my guess? How do you measure closeness when you're predicting that, yes, this customer is going to leave or no, this customer is going to stay with us, going to renew their cell phone contract? Um, how do I measure accuracy with that? And that changes things considerably. Um, we don't talk of big errors and small errors, do we? We're either right or wrong. Is that a big error or a small error? Um, no. Uh, these are tend to be cases where we're looking at large numbers of incidents of it. So we're looking at thousands of customers and what they're doing, or millions of transactions, what's happening on these things. We're not looking at each individual case. We're probably looking at, on average, how often are we right, on average. How often are we wrong? So it's a very different type of situation that I've got here. Um, that So it's not size of error anymore. It's frequency of error. And there are a lot of different measures we're going to get. It's not just standard error in R-square. Some people want to know, well, what percentage of the time are you right? Uh, do you give a correct classification? That so if I was doing a COVID test on you, what percentage of the time uh, am I right in diagnosing COVID when the person has it, and what percentage of the and what percentage of the time am I right when I say you don't have COVID when you don't have COVID? So maybe I'm merging those two things together because those are two different classifications. But of all the classifications I do, which percentage are right? That, but it may be, uh, like with transactions, of the fraudulent ones, what percentage of them am I able to detect and pick up that those are fraudulent? Of the valid transactions, what percentage of them do I identify correctly? Um, or maybe it's the reverse. I'm interested in how many errors I make. Um, different errors have different consequences. If you get a COVID test and it comes back positive and you really don't have it, <laughs> you're stuck with 14 days of quarantine <laughs> and you're stressed out and worried and you really don't have COVID. Um, that may upset you, but it's just you, okay? If, I, if you do have COVID and I say you don't have COVID and then you go out with your friends and have a good time and next thing you know, you've got five or six of your friends now have COVID. And they may be infecting their friends and their friends. That's how it grows exponentially. Um, how do you feel then when you were misdiagnosed? It's a different type of error, different type of consequence. How do we deal with that? We're going to look at that when we get to evaluation. Okay, That's going to come several classes from now. Um, towards the end, it's, I think chapter 11. So we'll get to it. But right now, I'd like to know, how do I do classification? And most of them are actually not perfect. They're not going to say, you've got COVID or you don't have COVID. 
we're going to do it on what's the chance you have COVID or what's the chance you don't have COVID? What's the chance this transaction is fraudulent or what's the chance this one is valid? And based upon that probability, we'll make a decision and we'll do a classification based upon that. That's a uh, challenging thing to do and it varies by context again, but we'll get to that. And um, you've got to make some Oops, I guess our class is over because it's warning me my next one's coming up. <laughs> that you may start thinking on that probability this looks like regression analysis, but it's a completely different type of regression analysis. Like, um, suppose I've got aptitude scores on a new employee, a math score and a verbal score, or a mechanical score and a a uh, dexterity score and a thinking skill score. And then I'm going to try to classify them. Are they a good employee, a one, or a not very good employee, a zero? So I've got a binary variable, but it's my outcome instead of one of the variables coming in. But we'll look at um, three different methods. I'll leave that till Monday to go through. And uh, they're all very, well, Two of them, at least, are very different from one another. And then somewhat later, uh, after we do some probability analysis, I'll introduce a couple other methods, which, again, are different again. There are a whole bunch of really different methods for doing this type of problem. But uh, we're out of time for now. So I can let you go. And uh, we'll pick it up later. It's not a big deal. You take care. Uh, good luck on the assignment. Email me if you have questions. If Excel is not working, send me the whole spreadsheet. Don't send me a screenshot. But uh, good luck. Take care. Bye-bye.